Hello, everybody. This is uh, Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, today I'm continuing in the study of the book of John, and I'm going to pick up at the beginning of chapter 11, uh, starting with verse 1. Uh, if you have not seen the previous studies that I've done on the book of John, uh, I hope you will go back and watch this from the beginning. Uh, those videos are available on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. Now, I am a KJV firstist, so I will look at it first in the KJV, and I will probably look at it uh, at least part of the time in the Amplified version. Uh, I, sometimes I find the Amplified version to be helpful. So let's begin now. Uh, Gospel of John, chapter 11 beginning with verse 1. Now a certain man was sick named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. Now, this is really very interesting. Uh, uh, we, we know that Lazarus is the person that dies and Jesus resurrects and he has the two sisters, Martha and Mary. Um, and in the Bible, in the New Testament, uh, there are references to the three different Marys. Uh, Mary, the mother of Jesus, uh, Mary, the uh, sister, the sister of uh, Lazarus, and uh, Mary Magdalene. Uh, now, a lot of times people think that. Um, a matter of fact, I, I saw this recently in a movie, uh, Risen. It's a popular movie that it's uh, been the number one box office attraction now for the last month or so. It's about the res the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. It's excellent. I really hope you will go see that movie. But this movie and many others before it, they've always re referenced um, uh, Mary Magdalene as being the prostitute. Uh, we think of um, the prostitute as, of course, the one that was going to be well, there was an adulteress who was going to be stoned, and Jesus intervenes and, and uh, says, if whoever has not sinned can cast the first stone. Uh, so that's, uh, that's, that's the adulteress. And a lot of people think that this was, that was Mary Magdalene or Mary Magdalene was a prostitute. There's, I don't see anything in the scriptures that support that Mary Magdalene was a prostitute. Uh, another thing is this this reference to this uh, anointing Jesus with uh, uh, ointment. Uh, and uh, it says here in verse 2, it was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus, Lazarus was sick. And we... I, we haven't covered that uh, account yet in the Gospel of John. It may be coming up, but I recall that um, she was criticized, probably, I think, by Judas for spending so much money, and also they s seem to look down on this woman, partly maybe because she's a woman, because uh, the Jewish men of that time always thought women were much less than men. and. <clears throat> uh, uh, it, it was a very um, uh, sexist attitude towards women in that society. But um, also, I think that they looked down on her because uh, there was something wrong with this woman in their eyes. Maybe she was promiscuous or adulterous or a prostitute. Uh, but uh, this now I'm seeing here that I hadn't really connected the dots on this before, but it's saying here this Mary who is the sister of Lazarus, the sister of Martha. That's the Mary that would, the, that uh, bought the ointment and, and anointed Jesus with her uh, 
uh, with her tears and her hair. So um, all this to, be, to, to, to say that uh, Mary Magdalene, she's in by many different people. I've heard them teach that she was a prostitute and I don't see anything to support that. In this case, Mary, the sister of Lazarus is this particular one that a lot of people disdain and say she Jesus said uh, don't criticize her what she's done here will be remembered throughout all of eternity that's that's how he much he recognized what she had done um, okay so I don't know if I've helped you at all with that but uh, I found it interesting that it's the first time I re really realized here that uh, that Mary, the sister of Lazarus, was, was this same one that uh, uh, wiped Jesus' feet with her hair. Um, let me read this in the Amplify, these first two verses. Now, a certain man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village where Mary and her sister Martha lived. It was the Mary who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. All right, uh, let's go to the KJV again for verse three. It says, therefore his sisters sent unto him saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. So uh, we know Jesus loved everybody. He taught us to love everybody, even to love our enemies. And yet, this person, Lazarus, is, seems to be singled out as uh, someone that Jesus loved. He says, uh, he whom thou lovest is sick. Uh, I don't know if that's supposed to mean that he had a special particular type of love for Lazarus. Maybe he knew Lazarus better than other people and they had a close uh, relationship. Uh, or maybe the way it's phrased in the KJV is uh, is uh, giving too much importance to it compared. Let's see how it's phrased in the Amplified. So the sister sent word to him saying, quote, Lord, he, our brother and your friend whom you love is sick. Uh, so in this, in this uh, translation, I don't get this uh, the same impression that uh, uh, this love he has for Lazarus is a special. Like we we do know that there's also a, a distinction for the love that he has for the apostle John. He's referred to as the beloved apostle. So people conclude that he loved John more than others, and uh, obviously I. He loves everybody, and does he really love John, the Apostle John, more than the others? Maybe so, uh, because he he knows the future, and he knew that John would be the only apostle that didn't desert him. John was there th through the arrest and the trial, and even at the foot of the cross, all the other apostles deserted him. Uh, so maybe he did have a special kind of love for John, and. Uh, according to the KJV, it looks like he had a special love for Lazarus, but according to the Amplified, he just phrases it that uh, uh, he, our brother and your friend whom you love. So, so in other words, I get the impression from this translation that it's someone that is your friend and you love them, but not that you have a, uh, a, a special particular uh, unusual type of love for him. Verse 4 in the KJV says, When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Well, when he says this sickness is not unto death, um, well, that seems to be incorrect because, because uh, Lazarus does die. The sickness leads to his death. But of course, we know that because of the resurrection, it's the death is not a death as uh, as the rest of us experience it. We're dead and and uh, waiting for this resurrection in the future that's promised to all of us. But no, uh, in, the, in Lazarus' case, Jesus knew that he would die, but it wouldn't be a real death because he would be uh, a re resurrected back to life. Um, 
uh, and he says that uh, he says this is all happening but for the glory of God that the Son of God might be glorified thereby so by uh, him not running to the rescue of Lazarus while he's sick allowing him to die he's saying that this is all happening for a reason it's so that you know I the Son of God will be glorified people will recognize uh, of these miracles he did were all for this purpose of, of being a sign to the people to, to, to prove that Jesus' claims were true. He is God uh, manifest in the flesh as the Son of God and the Savior. Let's read verse 4 in the um, Amplified, and it says, When Jesus heard this, he said, This sickness will not end in death, but on the contrary, it is for the glory of and honor of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified by it. All right, verse 5 in the KJV says, Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Uh, when he had heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. So uh, it would seem strange to people that, wait, your friend is is very sick, he may die, and yet you're just not even going to rescue him. You're, you're, uh, it says he, you, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. Verse 7 says, Then after that saith he to his disciples, Let us go into Judea again. His disciples say unto him, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone thee, and goest thou thither again? So they're wondering, what, what kind of a decision are you making here? You know, you, you know that the Jews are out to kill you, and now you're going to go right there to, and make yourself accessible to them so they can kill you? Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in the, in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not, because he seeth the light of the, this world. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth because there is no light in him. Uh, these things said he, after he saith unto them, our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go, that I may awake him out of sleep. So it's uh, this is one of many times where death is referred to as a state of sleep. Uh, now, let's look at this same verses in the Amplified. He said, uh, verse starting with verse 7, Then he said to his disciples, Let us go back to Judea. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, teacher, the Jews were only recently going to stone you, and you are thinking of going back there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours of light in the day? Anyone who walks in the daytime does not stumble because he sees by the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles, because there is no light in him. He said this, and after that said, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to wake him. So he's referring to this uh, death state as sleep, and, and this resurrection as to being uh, awakened. Verse um, 12 in the KJV says, then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. So they think of this is his term. Uh, uh, he sleeps as actually being sleeping rather than death. Then in verse 13, he says, how be it Jesus spake of his death. But they thought that he had spoken of taking of rest in sleep. Um, verse 14, then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Well, well, I think they could understand that. He spoke plainly in verse 15. And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there. To the intent ye may believe. Nevertheless, let us go unto him. So Jesus is saying, I'm, I'm, he's dead, and I'm glad I wasn't there to, to save him, because now you will be able to believe 
they they already believe in Jesus, but every miracle is strengthening their their faith and their belief in who he is. And yet, even after all these miracles, everyone but John flees at his arrest, and uh, they abandon him. Uh, it, it took his resurrection to uh, renew their faith and, and their their belief. Uh, and and the, the resurrection of, of Jesus is the, the sign that gives us all confidence that our, our faith in, in Jesus is justified. Um, verse 16, Then said Thomas, which is called Didymus, unto his fellow disciples, let us also go, that we may die with him. <laughs> so they know that Jesus is going right into like the lion's den to the, the Jews that want to kill him. And uh, he's saying, let us go with him. If, he, he, if he's going to die, we'll go with him and we'll die too. So it seems like at certain times there's a lot of bravery expressed and other times great cowardice from these uh, apostles. Verse 17 then when Jesus came, he found that he had lain in the grave four days already. So four times, four days in the grave. Uh, I mean, in a in a regular uh, burial, uh, uh, you know, they wrap you. They put, uh, you know, uh, various types of uh, uh, herbs and and. Uh, and things so that I guess is, I forgot what the purpose of it is. Really, I don't think it's really like an embalming type of thing to preserve the body, but maybe it's just to help with the smell. But I'm not sure why that would be important if uh, if it's in a sealed tomb and no one's going to smell it. But so he's he's buried. He's wrapped up in burial cloths, clothes, and he uh, he's been there for four days. So you'd of course expect his his body to be decaying and, and, and smelling. Verse 18, Now Bethany was nigh unto Jerusalem, about 15 furlongs off. Uh, let's look at verse 18 in the Amplified. Uh, it says, Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away. And many of the Jews had come to see Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning the loss of their brother. All right, so verse 20 in the KJV says, Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary sat still in the house. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it to thee. So, I mean, she's seen enough miracles at this point to just be absolutely confident that if Jesus asks that uh, that he will live. She, I mean, she, she's actually expecting that if you, if you want to do this, I know you can even raise him back to life. It's a great faith that she's uh, displaying in Jesus, and, and it's kind of like the... Uh, the uh, centurion that when jesus said there's no greater faith in all of israel than this man displayed because he said that uh, no you don't need to go to my home to to heal my servant just say the word and it'll be done um, so that was a great display of faith and this here from martha is a great display of faith in jesus uh, she says lord if thou hadst no uh, i but i know that even now even though he's been dead for four days, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it to thee. What else could, should, could she be thinking about other than a resurrection? Uh, and resurrections were uh, not common. Uh, I think there's only a record of uh, maybe one or two resurrections in the Old Testament that I can recall, I think by Isaac, uh, Elijah. Um, so to think that, for her to think that Jesus could raise her brother back to life after four days is, is an absolutely amazing thing. How could you even conceive of such an idea? That doesn't happen. 
I mean, healing people when they're sick and, and uh, you know, giving them sight. These are great miracles. But to raise someone from the dead after four days, that's unheard of. Uh, verse 23, Jesus said unto her, Thou brother shall rise again. Now, verse 24, Martha saith unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. See, this resurrection at the last day is still to come. And uh, that's what, that's we all, we all look forward to that resurrection. Um, there is a time coming at the end of the world where Jesus is going to raise everybody to life bodily, just like he raised Lazarus, just like Jesus was resurrected himself. Um, we will all, every person who's ever lived will be raised alive. The two groups of people, the just and the unjust. Uh, the, the resurrection of the just are the people who uh, will go to heaven because their faith in God. And, uh, and now we know that our, our, our faith is in our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. But because of that, we are resurrected unto life everlasting in, in uh, the kingdom of God in heaven, the new heavens and the new earth. That's what we look forward to in the resurrection of the, of the last days. And yet the people who are not saved, who never had faith in God for, for their salvation, they uh, will be also be resurrected. But it's their resurrection will be to the, to the judgment. And, and sadly, they go to this judgment just to get sentenced to the second death because they, um, they, they're lacking the one thing that could save them, and that was faith in Jesus. So he, uh, Martha is saying here what everybody believed, there will be a resurrection at the last day. And uh, she's saying, yes. Yes, Lord, you're right. Yeah, he will rise again at the last day, at the resurrection. But so Jesus then corrects her and says, Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? So, He's asking Martha, do you believe that I am the resurrection? I am the one that has the power over life and death. I am the source of life everlasting. And if you believe in me, you will have everlasting life. You will be raised to life and uh, you will never die. Uh, you never die again. So uh, then he asked her, do you believe this? Question, of course, the obvious question is, you who watch this video now, do you believe this? If you believe this, listen to what Jesus says to her. Uh, she saith, saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. And when she had said so said, she went her way and called Mary, her sister, secretly saying, The Master is come and call us for thee. Uh, so she, he asked her, do you believe in me? And she said, yes. She confessed her faith in him. He is the son of God, the Christ, the savior. And that, now that question goes to you. Do you believe in Jesus? Do you believe he has the power of life and death? Do you believe he will give you life everlasting as, 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 a, as a free gift because you've trust him? If you believe that, you receive that. Verse 29, as soon as she heard that, she rose quickly and came unto him. Uh, now Jesus was not yet come unto, into the town, but was in that place where Martha met him. So Marcia, Martha heard that she, he, Jesus was coming and she rushed out to meet him, kind of like the, the account of the, what's the story that's called, the, commonly referred to as the prodigal son, but the Bible doesn't ever use that term. I, I prefer to refer to this uh, story as the story of the backslidden son. The, the son left his father, went off and got into all kinds of mischief, 
he backslid, but he was still the man's son throughout. And then when he was returning, the father saw him from off and ran off to meet him. He didn't wait for him to come home. He went off to meet him. And this kind of reminds me of that in that it says that uh, now Jesus was not yet come into the town, but, but was in that place where Martha met him. In verse 31, the Jews then which were with her in the house and comforted her when they saw Mary, that she arose up hastily and went out, followed her, saying, She goeth unto the grave to weep there. That was their assumption. Uh, then when Mary was come where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying unto him, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping, which came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled and said, Where have ye laid him? They said unto him, Lord, come and see. Verse 35 is, Jesus wept. Uh, this verse here, 35, is famous for being the shortest verse in the entire Bible. Two words, Jesus wept. He felt their pain and their suffering and their, their grief, and he identified with it. Uh, verse 36, then said the Jews, Behold, how he loved him. And some of them said, Could not this man, which opened the eyes of the blind, have caused that even this man should not have died? So they're all saying, Couldn't he have saved him? You know, he was his friend. He, he didn't come to save him. Could He could have done it, couldn't he? Verse 38, Jesus therefore again, groaning in himself, cometh to the grave, it was a cave, and a stone lay upon it. Jesus said, Take ye away the stone, Martha, the sister of him that was dead, saith unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he hath been dead four days. Jesus saith unto her, Said I, said I not unto thee that if thou wouldst believe, um, uh, thou shouldest see the glory of God? So here, this is Martha saying, hey, he's been dead for four days. He stinks. So she's having this. She's not really believing at this point as she believed earlier that, wow, whatever you ask of God, he'll, he'll do. And it's, and it, I imagine, of course, that, that she means you could even raise him back to life. And now she's saying, hey, he, st he stinks if you, if you open that door. So. Uh, there's kind of a mixed uh, mixed feeling she's having. Verse 40, it says, Jesus saith unto her, Said I not unto thee, that if thou wouldest believe, thou shouldest see the glory of God? Yeah, believe, believe this. You'll see the glory of God. The glory of God is this demonstration of his power to raise Lazarus to life. And uh, the glory of God means it. God gets the glory. And that's the problem with most people uh, in their uh, religious faith is that uh, they they believe in uh, that they can earn salvation by doing religious works. And then therefore, they could boast and say, look, I deserve heaven. I've done the works. I'm good. Uh, and then what they're doing is they're, they're actually claiming glory for themselves saying look what i've accomplished i've lived a good life i deserve heaven but the bible tells us no glory belongs to god god gets all the glory god gets all the credit for our salvation he gets credit for our our life initially and our our new life in christ for verse 41 then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. So he's not asking the Father to, to raise him. He's thanking him, knowing him. That he's, already, he's already answered his prayer. And that's what the kind of prayer that we should say uh, in our salvation. There many people think that a person needs to say a prayer to, to get saved. Um, it, it, if you believe that uh, salvation comes you know, as a free gift from Jesus 
to everyone who puts their faith in him and relies upon him for salvation. If you believe that, you're saved at the moment you believe. You're saved before you could ever say a prayer saying, oh, God, save me. Or, you know, I believe you. I, I confess with my mouth that you're my savior. Before you could even say the sinner's prayer or the, the confession of faith, you're saved beforehand because you believe before you spoke. And this is what Jesus did here. Uh, he's not He's not asking God at this point. He's saying, I, kn I know you've answered my prayer. Uh, thank you. He says, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. And uh, the, the prayer that we should say after we believe in Jesus is, Jesus, I thank you. Verse 42 says, And I knew that thou hearest me always, but because of the people which, spy, which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. See, a lot of these things that he's doing here, like when he, when he made the... Uh, he spit on the ground and made mud and then put it on the man's blind man's eyes so that he could be healed. And he said, go wash your, your eyes in the pool. And he came back and he could see. I mean, he could have just healed him without going through that uh, little, uh, you know, making the mud and putting on his eyes. But he did it so people could observe and say, no, that they're, they're connecting the dots. The man was blind and now he sees. What caused it? Well, they know that Jesus caused it because of what he did to, as a demonstration. And here again, he's saying right here, uh, and I knew that thou hearest me always, but because of the people which stand by, I said it. So he said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. He, he's saying, I said that for their benefit. Father, I know I know I don't need to even say this because, but uh, I want them to know the, the people who are standing by and observing all of this, they need to know that they connect the dots that uh, I have asked you to raise him from the dead and he's raised from the dead. So uh, this is a result of, uh, of the father and the son. Uh, <clears throat> verse 42. And I knew that thou hearest me always. But because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. <clears throat> Verse 43, and when he thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. <clears throat> Could you imagine anybody saying something like that? You know, you're really putting yourself on the spot in front of everybody saying, right, come forth, come back to, come out of the grave from, uh, from death to life. I mean, you're, it can be very embarrassing if, if it doesn't happen. But, of course, Jesus doesn't fear embarrassment because he knows. He knows he's been raised back to life. Um, in verse 44, And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus saith unto them, Loose him and let him go. Verse 45. Then many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen the things which Jesus did believed on him. So these, these miracles cause some people believe, some people don't believe. They say, he, he, this is not the power of God he's, he's using. It's the power of the devil. And... Uh, claiming that Jesus' power came from the devil, that uh, Beelzebub. Uh, so people react a lot of different ways to seeing these miracles, but the miracles are the signs that Jesus used to prove that who he is. Uh, um, verse 46, But some of them went their way to the Pharisees and told them what things Jesus had done. Then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees at council and said, What do we? For this man doeth many miracles. Now, the logical thing to do for a normal person is say, ah, He's come. The Messiah is here. He's showing miracles. It's, he's proven he is our promised Messiah. But instead, they start, they form a council. They're doing some kind of a conspiracy to come against him instead of just rejoicing. 
that the Messiah has come. What is wrong with these people? Verse 48, if we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him. What's wrong with that, Pharisees? And the Romans shall come and take away both our place and our nation. Okay, that's what they're afraid of. They're afraid that if he rises, if they accept him and all the Jewish people, the, all of Israel embraces him as the Messiah, that the Romans will come down on them with great force with their military and destroy them all. And they'll also, says that, take away both our place and nation. Uh, our place means that they have a prominent pl place, in a, a powerful position. Their jobs are, they're, they're rich and powerful people. They don't want to lose that. Verse 40 died. And one of them named Caiaphas, being the high priest that same year, said unto them, Ye know nothing at all, nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people, and that the whole nation perish not. Yeah. So Caiaphas makes this decision that Jesus has to die. Uh, otherwise, uh, if they let him rise and prominence and, and uh, people uh, overall accept him as the savior that uh, the power of Rome will come down and the nation will perish. So he's saying uh, it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation uh, and that the whole nation perish not. And this spake he not of himself, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for that nation. He didn't even realize that, yeah, Jesus would die for the nation, but not in the respect that he was thinking he'll die and that will, will prevent Rome from crushing the, the crushing them. No, he died for the nation so that they could live. Uh, their sins will be paid for. They can have life everlasting. Something much greater than just having a, uh, you know, a, a good paying job and living as a, a, under Rome. And verse 52 says, and not for that nation only, but that also he should gather together in one the children of God that were scattered abroad. Um, well, you could take this as, uh, uh, this is a not for that nation only, the nation of Israel. But uh, some people would say, well, this is the, the people scattered abroad. This sounds a lot like in the book of James where the 12 tribes were scattered abroad. <clears throat> so, uh, are they thinking, uh, is it just so that uh, uh, the Jews, Jewish people in Israel <clears throat> and the Jewish people abroad uh, uh, will benefit from this? Or is it the people scattered abroad are all of the peoples of the world? Well, this verse 52 uh, obviously means that it's the people of the world. He says, and not for that nation only, not just for Jews, the Jewish people and the Israelites, but <clears throat> that all also should gather together in one in one the ch children of God that were scattered abroad, all the people of the world. Verse 53 says, <clears throat> then from that day forth, they took counsel together for to put him to death. So they made a, an agreement. They made a plan. We're going to somehow find a way of putting him to death. <clears throat> Verse 54, Jesus therefore walked no more openly among the Jews. Uh, Obviously, he knew they were out to kill him, and now even more so. But went thence unto a country near to the wilderness, into a city called Ephraim, <clears throat> and there continued with his disciples. And the Jews' Passover was nigh at hand, and many went out of the country up to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. <clears throat> then sought they for Jesus, and spake among themselves, and they stood in the temple. Uh, what think ye? that he will not come to the feast? Uh, so they're wondering if he's going to be coming for the Passover um, uh, or not. And verse 57, Now both the chief priests and the Pharisees had given a command that if any man knew where he were, he should show it that they might take him. So the plan has been made, and uh, the spies are all looking out, and they want to capture him and kill him.
All right, so that's the end of chapter 11. <clears throat> I'll end with just a, a short um, salvation message. Uh, you probably understand salvation just from listening to this study, but um, there, there's, there's two ways um, that um, people say is the means of salvation, the means to heaven. Uh, the, the popular way that most people believe is that man can establish his own righteousness by doing religious works and good good things and and um, uh, shying away from and, and, and uh, rejecting a sinful life and embracing a good good life where you're doing good and not bad. And they think that well, if I do well enough at this, Perhaps God will say, you're good enough, you get to go to heaven. It's the, it's the system of personal merit. And, and that's, that's what almost all the people in the world believe, that uh, heaven uh, is obtained uh, through your own religious works. It's earned through personal merit. But that's, that's the popular way that people, uh, most people believe. There's another way that we find in the Bible and, and that's what Jesus says. It says, I'm the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So he says, no, the, there's no other way. Personal merit is not the way. Joining a religion, becoming religious, following your religious rules, none of those things will work. I'm the one and only way. You need to trust me. Uh, so the Bible tells us that uh, salvation is offered to you as a free gift to everyone. The Bible says, whosoever, whosoever means any person without exception, can receive it. Uh, all, all that's required of you is faith in Jesus. Uh, so right now, if you've never put your faith in Jesus, what you need to do is, is uh, you need to be convinced and come to the conclusion that there is no other way to get to heaven. Uh, you can never go before God and say, look how good I am. I live such a good life. I deserve heaven. Reject that. Because if, if you, you do find yourself in that position and you're making pl your plea to God, I'm good enough. I deserve heaven. You owe me because I've been good. God will reply to you, depart from me. I never knew you. So give up on that. It can't work. It's impossible. Jesus said that is impossible. Instead, put your faith in Jesus, rely upon him, depend completely on Jesus as the means of your salvation. Now, who is he? He is eternal God Almighty, who loved us so much that he came down from heaven, became a man, was manifest in the flesh. He, he as the son of God, Jesus Christ, he lived a perfect, sinless life, and he he died on a cross and that death on the cross served as a payment for all sin. Every sin you've ever done your whole life. Of all the people who have ever lived, all the sin, the sum total of all sin was put on Jesus Christ. The Bible says he became sin for us. Imagine all these sins put on one person. It would seem like that is sin. They're, well, Jesus paid for all of our sins. That's what the Bible tells us. And because he paid for our sins, now we have access to God. We can have a relationship with God. The Bible says that at the death of Jesus on the cross, the curtain in the temple was torn from top to bottom. That curtain separated the public area from the Holy of Holies. The public could not go into the Holy of Holies uh, because uh, no one had, could have access to God. So the curtain separated. When the curtain was torn in half, it opened it up and said, now you can come to God because of what Jesus did for you. He paid for your sins. So reconciliation now is possible. And, but it must be done through Jesus Christ. And then not only did he die on that cross and he was buried, but as Lazarus was resurrected, Jesus too was resurrected bodily. 
but Raz Lazarus was raised to, to die again. Jesus was raised with a glorified body that never dies. And that's what's promised to all of us who put our faith in Jesus. We will be raised to life, life, life everlasting because of our faith in Jesus. So the resurrection of Jesus, that bodily resurrection, is the proof Jesus gave us that he is God. He is the Savior. He does have power over life and death. He promises life everlasting to you if you trust him. And because the Bible says God cannot break a promise, God cannot lie, you can feel certain you're going to go to heaven. You can, you're guaranteed it. So put your faith in Jesus today and receive the free gift of salvation and eternal life. Thank you for joining me today and hope you'll join me for these uh, future broadcasts. Bless you in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.